be done. Well, Danny is home. I think she said he got a good nap this afternoon, so y'all pray for Danny and Anita. And I don't think Duke is going to have a meeting about him this week to see what the next steps are. And also pray for Cindy Rutherford. Her dad's real sick today, so I know they would covet and appreciate your prayers. Take your Bibles and turn to Nahum chapter 1. Nahum chapter number 1, beginning in verse 3. God is a faithful and a conscientious manager. Is anyone in control of this chaos? No. Satan's not in control of it. You're probably not going to believe what I'm going to say, but God's not in control of it either. He can't be because of sin. He will be one day, but right now he has to manage what's going on. I started my outline and I started putting control. And I said, no, God's not controlling things. He's managing things right now because he's going to control it when he comes. Amen. But right now he's just managing. And he's a faithful and a conscientious manager. No matter how chaotic the world seems to be, he is alive, well, and aware. Chaos is Satan's deceptive smokescreen to try and convince the world that there is no God, there is no supreme authority, and man is in control of his own destiny. And he's done very good at preaching those lies. He says rules must be followed or the world will plunge into chaos. That's what the Bible says. And they're not following the rules and the world is in chaos. Do you agree with that tonight? I do. The more the church preaches the truth, the louder the world mocks us and denies the truth. The world tries to overpower God in the church by chanting the saying, a might makes right. No, might doesn't make right because if might made right, God would be in control. Say amen. He's almighty. No, might doesn't make right. Right is right because God says it's right. And he'll make things right in the end. God plus one makes a complete majority. If you don't believe that, go to Mount Carmel with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. They cried, they cut themselves, they screamed, they hollered, they danced, no fire came from heaven. But I believe it was a 67 word prayer that Elijah prayed <laughs> and fire came down from heaven and not only licked up the altar but all the water they had poured on it and everything around it. God plus one makes a majority. No matter what the world preaches or what the world propagates, God is great, God is good, and there's still hope for the neighborhood. Amen? There is. Sometimes at a basketball game or a football game, you wonder if the referee's blind, dead, drunk, or bribed. Amen? Wonder a lot of things. They blow no whistles, they call no fouls, they exercise no authority to keep the game within the rules of play. They call no infractions of the rules. It seems that the cheaters are gonna prevail and they're gonna steal the win over those who've tried to honor the rules and play the game by the rules. And that does happen, ask the New Orleans Saints. <laughs> Everything's not always fair, is it? And you wonder, where's God in all this chaos? Why isn't he blowing a whistle? Why isn't he calling out infractions? He is. But man's not listening. I preach the word around the world every day on the internet, but nobody's listening. They'd rather watch something else that doesn't have anything to do with God or read something that had not anything to do with God, something that'll pleasure their eyes or their uh, heart. Folks, trust me. Trust me, my friend. God is alive. He's well. He's paying full attention. And he is still in control. 
Even though there's chaos, he's in control. Our course is set, and we're on the pathway of complete and total victory. No matter what people say or do, or how things are looking today, everything's all right. In the book of Nahum, Assyria had come in and taken the 10 northern tribes captive, and they were in control. They were a proud and an arrogant people, sounded a lot like America today. But not only that, they were vicious and they were merciless to their enemies. A hundred years prior to the book of Nahum, Jonah had come to the same country, the same capital of Assyria, Nineveh. He preached the gospel and the whole city turned to God. The whole city got right with God. But a hundred years later, it's utter chaos again. You say, well, what happened, preacher? They came to God. I'll tell you what happened. You can't blame the Ninevites. You can't even blame Assyria. Well then, preacher, who do you blame? Jonah. Preacher, why are you blaming Jonah? He did what the Lord said do. He come back and preached and the whole city got saved. Jonah did his job. I beg to differ with you. He did half his job. You see, he had hatred in his heart for the Ninevites and the Assyrians because they killed his parents. He hated them. He despised them. And after he saw the city turn to God, he was disappointed because he didn't want them to turn to God. He wanted them all to go to hell and burn forever. He had a bad heart. Let me say something very clear, and I don't mean to be ugly, but I'm being honest. Before we blame the world for the condition of our church or the condition of our lives, no. If anybody's to blame for the chaos in this world, it's not God. It's not even the lost. It's the selfishness of the church because we're too selfish to give of our time, talent, and treasure to do the work of God. Say amen or oh me. Jonah climbed up on a hill. <laughs> Boy, it's such a true story. He climbed up on the hill <clears throat> and he sat down and he started praying. God, kill them all. God, send down fire from heaven and burn them up. He had vengeance in his heart. He had hatred. He despised them. But that wasn't his job. He should have stayed down there among those people and taught them the scriptures and taught them the Bible, and taught them the Old Testament truths, and discipled them, and nurtured an admonition of the Lord, and seen them grow spiritually, but he did not. You know, we're real easy to jump on Governor Northam, which he needs to be jumped on. We're easy to jump on Governor Northam because he, he, he promoted infanticide. But that's no difference to what a lot of churches are doing to a lot of people after they get saved and they turn their back on them and don't try to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's just as bad as infanticide. When you see somebody get saved and you start shooting them and pulling the rug out from under them and judging them, we're, we're no better than, than an abortionist. No better. We have a responsibility to love each other. Amen? And the older Christians teach the younger Christians not get jealous because they're there and pull the rug out from under them. I'm telling you now. Jonah, instead of falling in love with a whole city, I mean, boy, I, I'd go crazy. I'd be printing ABCs of spiritual growth right and left. I'd be starting Bible studies on every corner if the whole city turned to God. I'd be doing everything I could to teach them the word of God. But Jonah blew his stack walked up on a hill, sat down, and looked over at this gourd and said, ain't you pretty? And he watered the gourd. And he fertilized the gourd. And he pulled the weeds out from around the gourd. And that gourd grew up and become a shade over him. And he, while he hated the people of Nineveh, he fell in love with a stupid plant. And I done told you, God don't put up with junk. If you truly save, he ain't gonna let you do what you wanna do. So the Bible says, go read the book of Jonah, it's right in there. 
God sent a little worm. You ever planted a beautiful row of tomato plants? Watered them, fertilized them things that's standing straight up with blooms on them. You go to bed at night so with dreams of tomatoes sandwiches, with dreams of tomato puddings and oh, sliced tomatoes and onions with green beans and meatloaf, all just dancing in your head. You all excited and you're looking forward to just a couple of eight weeks, nine weeks down the road. That whole row of beautiful standing up straight tomatoes is going to feed you. And you get up the next morning, about nine or ten of them just laying over flat. Look like a buzz saw done come through. And I'm, What's that called? Come on, tell me. Oh, y'all ain't tomato farmers? I am. Call a cutworm. That sucker cut it off right at, the, right at the top of the plant. Dead it is. No mate is going to ever grow from that thing. The cutworm got it. Well, God said to Jonah, okay, old boy, you love that gourd more than you love them souls you want. I'll take care of you. I'll kill your gourd. And you know what Jonah wanted to do? He wanted to commit suicide over a gourd. Now, look. I love plants, they're delicious. But I ain't never know one I want to commit suicide over. Hello? He was demented and twisted by the devil. He didn't see things straight. So before we get all upset because of the chaos we're in and jump on the lost world, Maybe it's not the lost world that's the real cause of the chaos we're in. Maybe it's the Christian world which fails to rise up to its responsibilities and do its job. We gotta understand this. Because I, I mean, I've thought it in my mind, you have too. Why has God put up with all this mess? Why is God putting up with all this sin? Why is God allowing these people to do all this stuff, infanticide and, and, and abortion and drugs and alcohol and, and rape and murder? Why does God allow them to do it? Why does he let them get away with it? Why did he let you get away with what you did till he saved you? Think about them apples. What if he got mad with you before you ever got saved and cut you off before you had a chance to get saved? got to look at the character of God a little bit. He's a God of mercy. You see, God sent Nahum now to pronounce judgment on Assyria. And not only to pronounce judgment on Assyria and say, look, if y'all don't straighten your act up, you're going to get judged. He gave him a chance to get right. But he also did it to encourage Israel. Yes, Israel was being done wrong. They were in captivity. They were in slavery. They were being dominated by another country. And they were hurting and they were suffering. But they were suffering because they had turned their back on God. Amen? They had gone into captivity because of their own sin. But here God's showing not only mercy to the Assyrians, but he's showing mercy to the Israelites. Within 50 years of Nahum preaching this book, the Assyrians were gone. His prophecy was true. God told him the truth. So God is trying to help Israel. Before the Assyrians were defeated, Israel had to exist until the Lord fulfilled his word. You know what I mean you got to do? Exist until the Lord fulfills his word. That means we've got to follow these principles that Nahum gave Israel. If we're going to make it through all this chaos in Richmond, chaos in Washington, chaos in Danville, I, I, I look, I'm 55 years old. If you had asked me 25 years ago if there was a rat monkey's head chance of ever hearing about a them thinking about putting a casino in Danville, I'd have laughed you to death. This is the buckle of the Bible belt. Say amen or oh man. I'd have never thought no such a thing. But man, there's chaos everywhere. Not only in Washington, Richmond, there's chaos in Danville. There's chaos in Lynchburg. I got a call 
I mean, I didn't get a call. I was looking on the internet, reading the news the other day, and I saw this guy had been arrested for multiple sexual assaults. And I said, boy, that fellow looks mighty familiar. So I pushed my glasses up like that, and I got closer to the screen. I said, boy, that guy looks familiar. Well, then the next day, I come back, and they had a backup story, and they said, they're on the look for him, they can't find him, and they put his name in there, what they called him, not his real name, but what they called him. I said, that's him. I led that boy to the Lord when he was 10 years old, and I baptized him. You want something to break your heart? You want something to break your heart? You see that. To know you led that person to the Lord and now they're a fugitive from the law for doing horrible things. And I sit at my desk and I thought, dear God, did I fail him? No, I didn't. But his family did. Family got out of church, quit serving God, living their own way, and hey, look what happened. There's something to this being faithful. How are you faithful in the midst of all this chaos? Israel had three choices. Number one, they could cave in and continue sinking into an utter state of despair. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm afraid that's what a lot of Christians are doing. They're caving in, giving up, just going right along with the world. I, I've been working on some messages for when I get done with this New World Order stuff. And they're going to be some tough sermons, folks. I'm not going to lie, and I don't even know if I'm going to survive them or not. But there's some things that's got to be said. There's some things that's got to be preached. Because we are getting to the point, instead of standing for God, we're caving in. And we're giving in. Not in big ways, but in little ways. But once a crack starts, it doesn't stop. You get a little crack in a windshield. Ask Mike Mills back there. And you just let the weather keep working on that crack. Hot, cold, hot, cold. What's going to happen, Mike? It's going to spread. It's going to get worse to utterly until the windshield's no good anymore. I had a car one time, had a little crack in his eye. I ain't going to fool with that. Things all right. <laughs> Me and Wendy were sitting in the house, whining our own business. Me and the boys was watching TV. And we heard, wham! I said, dear Lord, what was that? I jumped up, I thought somebody had shot a gun. And I looked around, I thought, well, I don't see no bullets nowhere. I ain't nobody shot dead, but where did I? Wendy went outside and she says, you better come look at your car. My car, for what? The whole back windshield blew slam, I think it was the back windshield, wasn't it? Blew slam out, like a bomb had gone off. I didn't even know there was anything wrong with that thing. But it was so hot that day, the pressure kept what? Building, 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 to finally that thing went <laughs> shattered into a thousand pieces. Listen to me, I love you. But I'm afraid that you and I are letting little things, we're caving in because we can't stand the pressure people are putting on us because there's so much pressure from the outside to give in. We give in and then we give in when the devastation comes. Where did it come from? How did this happen? It happened because you caved in. You gave in. You gave the devil an inch. Listen to me. This is a totally different saying. You may not have heard it before. You gave the devil an inch and he became your ruler. And you didn't even realize it. Because you caved in. You gave in just a little bit. You gave in just a little bit to take the pressure off of you. You had no idea that it was going to be your destruction, but it will be. We've got to learn to stand. Amen? Not cave in. Not give in, give out, or give up. We've got to stand. Number two. We can either cave in and continue sinking into utter a state of despair. Or number two. They could compromise their faith and live in somewhat of a state of peace with the Assyrians. <laughs> I'm afraid we've done that too. Folks, people are, are calling us bigots because we stand on the word of God. They're calling us 
intolerant. I'm not out to hurt anybody. I'm not out to rob anybody of what they call their civil rights. If you want to go and commit abortion, that's your business. But it's my business to do everything I can to tell you it's wrong before you make that mistake. You can be a homosexual or a lesbian if you want to. You can live that lifestyle. You can pretend you're getting married. You can't get married when you're gay. It's not problem, possible. No such thing as a gay marriage. It's not, it's not, marriage is a God's estate picturing the marriage between a man and a woman. It cannot happen between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. It cannot happen. It doesn't happen. It is a religious thing. I do take it personal because they're trying to pervert the picture of salvation God made for me and you, and that's a marriage. They call us intolerant. I'm not going to shoot them. I'm not going to string them up and hang them. I'm not going to cause them any heartache. But I got the right to stand up and say they're wrong. And I got the right to protect my family from falling into that mess. I've got that right. And folks, but we're caving in. I mean, I'm here now that even Methodist churches are allowing gay and lesbians to pastor their churches. Southern Baptist churches are, that's an abomination. But they're doing what it says here. They're compromising their faith to live in somewhat of a state of peace with people. I'm sorry, the Christmas message this year was clear. When those angels said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, them angels won't talk about peace between men and men. Them angels were talking about a peace between God and man. He sent Jesus to die to pay their sin debt so there could be peace between heaven and earth. Not man to man. There's never going to be peace man to man because we're not perfect. We're fallible. So folks, look, we've got to stop this foolishness of we just got to get along. No, we don't. Agree to disagree and stand your ground. Now, that don't mean agree to disagree and slap somebody. No, that's not what I said. Agree to uh, disagree and shoot somebody. No. They can, they can live their life and you can live yours, but you live yours for God. And just live with the fact that, look, I, I've got a preacher friend of mine and I, I feel so sorry for him and his wife. They live in another state. And their neighbor sold their house to two gay men. The first thing they found out a preacher was next door. His wife was out in the yard. They come down and said, if y'all don't do something about them dogs, we're going to kill them. Now, that, that won't matter about them dogs. You know what they didn't like? There was a man of God living next door to him preaching the word of God. That's what they didn't like. His wife took a Bible and took it over to him and wrapped it up and, says, and some other things. Food. I mean, not just a Bible. It was a whole basket full of stuff trying to give him the gospel. He reached in the basket said, we don't believe this mess. It's a fairy tale. That's where the anger was. And folks, they have done everything in the world they can to antagonize that preacher and his wife. But bless that preacher and his wife. They've stood their ground. They haven't been ugly. They've done everything they could to keep peace. But they're not going to compromise their stand on the word of God. Folks, why, not, why are you saying that, preacher? Because I'm going to tell you what, you're going to wake up tomorrow the next day one, and somebody like that's going to be moved in next to you. What are you going to do? How are you going to act? I'm going to tell you something, folks. The world is getting wickeder and wickeder by the day. What are you going to do if an abortion doctor moves in next to you? What are you going to move in if a drug dealer moves in next to you? How are you going to react? Well, you better be careful. There's a fine line. Don't lose your testimony, but don't lose your testimony. <laughs> okay? Don't blow your stack, but don't give in and compromise what's right. Amen? We cannot compromise what we believe just to get along. Somebody told me one time, says, ain't you coming to the Ministerial Association dinner? I said, nope. 
Yeah, but they having prime rib. And they having all kind of cake and dessert. Just come on, have a meal with them. They ain't going to bite you. They ain't going to rub off of you. I said, no, and I ain't going to rub off on them either. I know in whom I believe and persuade as he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day, and I don't need no ministerial association to help me do what God called me to do. Oh, you think you're better? No, I said, I didn't say that. I said, I'm not compromising what I believe to sit beside somebody who compromises what I believe. I'm not going to sit beside a man who says that you can work your way to heaven when that's not true. I'm not going to sit beside somebody who says you can be baptized and go to heaven when that's not true. We're saved by faith through grace. Amen? So look, I wish that ministerial association well. I hope they do all the good deeds they can do. I'm not against them, but I'm not going to compromise my testimony and help them. I'm not going to hurt them. I'm not going to harm them. I'm not going to say anything bad about them. But I'm not going to sit at the table and eat with them. I'm not going to fellowship with them. Why? Because I cannot, I cannot compromise the truth of what I believe. Number three, you cave in and continue seeking into an understate of despair. You can compromise your faith and live in somewhat of a state of peace with the enemy. Or number three, you can consecrate your trust in God, believe him, and look to him for sustaining grace, which provides hope. I, I, I don't hate anybody. I don't hate somebody because they've got a sin in their life. I'm not going to try to hurt somebody because they've got a horrible sin. But you know what I am going to do? I'm going to do everything I can to tell them about Jesus. I'm going to do everything I can to be good to them and point them to the cross. Point them to Calvary. Tell them that Jesus died for them. He died to save them from that sin that's eating their life up. And he saved them so he could turn them loose, set them loose so they could serve him and live for him. That's what I'm going to do. But I'm not going to give in to them. I'm going to stand my ground and do my job. I'm going to be faithful. That's not going to be easy. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Sins in this world, I, when I was a kid, if you went out and done some of the things my family's done in the past 10 years, back in them days, they'd have strung you up and killed you. I'm just telling you. I ain't saying it's right. It ain't right. But they would have. I mean, you never heard of stuff like you're hearing today. I mean, there was nobody in our family that ever took drugs. We didn't have any drug addicts in our family. Ain't true today. Ain't true today. There were no homosexuals and lesbians in my family. Ain't true today. Ain't true today. And folks, you know why? Because the world's getting darker and darker and darker and darker and more wicked. How in the world are we going to survive this thing till Jesus comes? By just standing on the truth and loving the Lord. And he will give you the faith you need to make it till Jesus comes. Now don't get scared. You don't have a heart attack. There are seven points in this message and that was just the introduction. I'm not going to give you all seven tonight, but I'm going to start, okay? First of all, we have the same three choices to make today. Nahum lays out seven points of argument for Israel to choose to consecrate themselves to God to get this grace and to get this hope so we can make it till Jesus comes. Sometimes I don't think I'm going to make it till Jesus comes. I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, it seems like sometimes it gets so hard and so tough dealing with people day in and day out. I mean, I'm not talking about the lost world. I'm talking about Christians. If a preacher today stands in the pulpit and preaches on somebody's sin, boy, they'll take their tithe and just run down the road to another church that'll accept the compromiser. They, they will. It's tough. I mean, you lose people all the time. I had somebody about two years ago. I went to see him and said, you hadn't seen your church in a while. Well, I just can't take your preaching. I said, did I spit on you? No. Have I got halitosis? Well, they didn't answer that one, but anyway. I said, well, what, what's the problem? Well, I just don't agree with you on this, and I don't agree with you on that, and I just can't stand to hear you preach against it. So I'm going somewhere else. And you know what they did? They went somewhere else. You work and bring people in, 
But the truth, folks, <laughs> the truth's gonna thin the ground. Say amen or oh man. Truth's gonna thin the ground. And folks, if we want this grace and this hope till Jesus comes, first of all, in verse three, God manages his wrath. You've got to believe God manages his wrath. Look at verse three. Eight. The Lord is what? Slow to anger and great in power. You say, preach, that don't make sense. Why has he got to be slow to anger if he's got all the power? One word, mercy. Mercy. He does not want people to go to hell. And neither should we. Neither should we. God was merciful to us before he saved you and me. And he gives all men the same chance to repent. Yes, he was angry at the Assyrians for turning their back on him after he saved them. And going back to idolatry in the ways of the world. Turning on Israel. Oh, he, he was upset because of that. But he was angry at the Assyrians for turning their back. Yet, we must realize, and Israel had to realize, the reason for his patience was he wanted to give them one more chance. Because God is the God of the what? Second, third, fourth, thank God sometimes fifth chance. After Jonah won the city, he turned around in bitterness and resentment and prayed that God would destroy the city that he had just led to repentance. I don't already said that's infanticide, spiritual infanticide. All those new Christians, he just turned his back on them, walked away. He left them alone with no discipling or teaching. They never had a chance to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. God manages his wrath because he sees the whole picture and he's not willing that any should perish. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is what? Long-suffering to usward, you and me, not the lost, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Folks, God wants us to repent. I'm glad he's the God. I've messed up sometimes. And I'm glad he gave me a second, third, fourth chance sometimes. Listen to me. Be encouraged. God is waiting on potential souls. Haste is waste. So next time you get upset because the world's in such chaos, remember, remember, be encouraged. God is waiting on potential souls. So if he's waiting on potential souls, what should you and I be doing? Waiting on potential souls. Now, number two, God manages the wicked. He not only manages his wrath, his anger, he manages the wicked. Look at the last second part of verse three and will not at all equip the wicked. He said, they're not gonna get away with it. They don't turn to me, they're not gonna get away, but judgment's coming. There will be a time when God will take no for an answer and enough will be enough and his judgment will fall. The wicked will get their just reward for rebellion and we'll get our just reward for repentance. And when that time comes, it'll be the right time. It'll be the fair time. Psalms chapter 37 verse 28 tells us about forever, ever. The Lord loveth judgment, fairness, and forsaketh not his saints, the ones he's loved and saved. They are preserved, how long? Forever. But the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. Next time you get angry because of the chaos that's in the world we're living in, stop to think. This is the only hell you're ever going to know. You can make it. You can make it through all of this. You're going to live forever. Even if they kill you, even if they kill you, you're going to live forever. So don't, let, don't sweat it. Understand that it's forever. That'll help you make it through this chaos. They're not going to be happy forever. They're not going to be in control forever. They're going to lose their power. Number two, not only ever, but number two, exalted. Look at Isaiah 30, verse 18. And therefore will the Lord what? Wait, that he may be gracious unto who? you and therefore he will be exalted circle that in your bible that he may have mercy upon you for the lord is a god of judgment blessed are all <laughs> that wait for him we got to wait for the lord sometimes i talk to christians and they're so frustrated i just wish the lord would come back don't say that 
Just wait on him. Just wait on him. He's doing something. He's working things out. People are being saved. And in the end, you'll be rectified. People may make fun of you now. I, I get hurt because a lot of my family won't have anything to do with me. I can go to a family activity and boy, I'm like, I got the plague. You know why? Not because I'm a bad person, but because I'm a saved person. And then when they see me, I bring conviction to them because there comes a preacher, watch out. There comes a preacher, he's gonna get on you. I mean, that's just the way they are. And it'll give you a complex, it will. I mean, sometimes I say, well, why even go? They're not gonna speak to me anyway. They don't have anything to do with me anyway, but you gotta go anyhow. I can go to a funeral, preach a funeral. And boy, they're there during the funeral, but as soon as I say amen, I can't find my family. They're gone. I think, Lord of mercy, what did I do to them? And I smell, well, I mean, what's the problem here? Hey, folks, it hurts personally, but just wait on the Lord. He's doing something, okay? It's tough, it's hard, it's rough, but he's doing something. You'll be exalted, and you'll be, and there'll be a time when they will say, boy, I wish I'd listened to them. Or they'll say, boy, I'm glad I did listen to them. Amen? Boy, I'm glad I listened to them. Just wait on the Lord. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep, what? No more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. He's going to answer your prayers. When he shall hear it, and he shall answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, ye shall, uh, yet shall not thy what? Teachers be removed from a, a corner anymore. You see, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but it's a fact God gives you pastors and teachers to be encouragement to you. But you can't get people to come to church. I ain't talking about lost people. You can't get Christians to come to church. Blows my mind. I ain't never seen that beat in my life. Just won't come to church. Oh, my toe hurts. Well, it's going to hurt at home. Let it hurt at church. Oh, my back hurts. I can't sit that long. Mike will not be upset if you stand back there beside him. You be upset, Mike, somebody stand up against the wall back there beside you. No, he ain't going to be upset. You know, stand if you got to stand, sit if you got to sit. Bless God, if you want to lay down, we'll put your pillow up here. Come on. Be in the house of God. I'm so tired. Well, sleep here. You sleep here when you're here anyway. <laughs> At least you're here. <laughs> Amen. At least you get credit for being present. You won't get credit if you lay at home in the bed. Hey, folks, listen. He's going to give you the bread of affliction, the water of affliction, the bread of adversity, but he's give you pastors to give you the word of God to give you a motivation to go on. That's why he gave me this message. You'll know what I'm going to do here in a few minutes. But I want you to take this message and give it to other people. Why? Because we need encouragement. We're getting beat down, folks. We're getting beat down on every corner, everywhere we go, and it's going to get worse as time goes on. Then it says, And thine ears shall hear the word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it, and ye shall turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. Just listen to us as we teach and preach you the word of God, and you'll know where to go and what to do. We'll be an encouragement to you. We'll be a help to you if you just listen. Ever, and then one day you'll be exalted or, or uh, exonerated. Then execute. Verse 23, chapter 23 of Jeremiah, verse 5. But the day shall come, saith the Lord, that I'll raise unto David a righteous branch. A king shall reign and prosper. And shall what? Who is that king? It's Jesus. He's already come, but he's coming again. And he's going to execute judgment when he comes. But we've got to wait till he comes. We're not to execute judgment. We're to love and reach out and encourage and give the gospel, whether they accept it or not. It says very clearly that in justice in the earth, in his, in his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell in what? Dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Now here's the one you're looking for, the last one. This is a tickle verse. 1 Peter 2.21, example. We know we're going to live forever. We know we're going to be exalted one day and everybody's going to know we were right. We know that he will execute judgment. We shouldn't. Don't be a judge. Don't go around pointing your finger in people's faces and putting them down. 1 Peter 2.21, 
For he, even hereunto ye were what? Were ye what? Called. Because Christ also suffered, he suffered, so why shouldn't we? He suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps who did know he didn't cave and he didn't compromise. He stood his ground. Neither was guile found in his mouth. He didn't hate people. I'm not a hater. They can say I'm a hater and a bigot all they want to. I'm not a hater. I'm not a bigot. I stand on the word of God. I don't hate anybody except them two dogs in my house. And I ain't talking about my two sons either. I'm talking about them two dogs. Verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he what? Threatened not. But committed himself to him that judgeth what? Righteously. Just say, okay, Lord, I trust you. I'm going to follow you. I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to lose my testimony. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to cave. I'm going to be a Christian who is absolutely consecrated to you. God needs some Christians who are going to take these seven principles and consecrate their life. I'm preaching to the cream of the crop here tonight. I gave you two of those principles. I'm going to give you the other five next week. But folks, take these principles. When you leave here tonight, we're going to give you three of these little booklets to carry with you. One for yourself and two for two other people. Next time you hear somebody say, I can't handle the pressure of being a Christian, you give them that little book. You give them that little book. You encourage them, like I'm encouraging you. Don't give in, don't give out, don't give up, don't cave, and absolutely don't compromise. But be consecrated. Why? Because the Lord manages his wrath. He's under control. And the God manages the wicked. Their judgment will come in their time. Not in our time. We got to wait on him. Would you stand to your feet?